Um, good morning. Um, my name is Michael, and today we'll talk about HS2 governance and specifically about data sovereignty. Um, to begin with, we'll make a short introduction and a short historical discourse on the topic and start with the era that probably everyone is mostly familiar with. We'll talk about internet in general and history of internet, which may seem a bit not, not that related to the topic, but it has some relation. Can you put the sound up a little? It's a little bit difficult to hear back here. Maybe it's not so my problem with me. Is it better now? Yes, I have. Uh, it's all the way up. Yeah. Yeah. Is it better? Yeah. Okay. We'll try. Okay. Okay. So let's talk a bit about the evolution of the web. And if you look at the slide, you will see that first of all, it has an internet that was simply to connect different services. Everyone was thinking about how the services are connected, and the core change of that time was to make simply make things work. It dates back to 1970s, 1980s. Then people started talking about the idea of consumption of information, and this is where Web 1.0 comes. And most of the websites, if you remember, were just static websites when everyone was downloading pages, downloading content, some uh, lightweight graphics, and it was uh, pretty straightforward. It was new and it was a kind of a advanced technology at that time. Then Web, uh, Web 2.0 came and we got into the world where we can not only consume the content, but where we can create the content and share information, upload the data to the services online, and to use the data in a, some kind of a easy and straightforward way. And now more and more people talk about Web 3.0, where we are not only sharing the data, where, where we are not only reading information, where we are not creating something, but we also start thinking about how do we control what we share, and how do we uh, let's say own what what is information or what the information we have. Um, if we look and this is point of view, if we look at the world around and especially health information system systems, we are somewhere in between the web 2.0 and web 3.0. And uh, in, in more, for most of us, it is not a very let's say uh, cutting edge way of thinking. So we think about centralized services. We think about services that are used for sharing information, but not we don't think about ownership. And in the recent years, maybe two or three years, if you look at what's going on in the world of regulation, in the world of the intentions, uh, there, is a, there, there is a strong trend of owning the information, having control of information, and trying a holistic approach to managing the data. And this topic is related to data governance, and this is what we'll talk about today. We'll start with a definition of data governance, and uh, the one that comes with standards is quite complicated, so I tried to make it a bit more straightforward. Uh, for those who are more deeply interested in the topic, I would recommend looking into the ISO standard 8505. Which is a quite a recent one and dates back to 2017 and describes quite a lot of concepts. Just a heads up, uh, whatever we will discuss here today will be not very aligned with the standard. We will discuss different approaches and different ideas around data governance. It's not the summary of the standard, and the, the people who wrote the standard may have a different view of this topic. But at the same point of time, the standard is a good reference for implementers. And once you start 
thinking about how data governance applies to your systems, to your scope of responsibility, looking into the ISO standard is a generally is a good start. So if you look at the definition, it talks about availability, it talks about usability, integrity, and security of the data. And if we look to the essence of data governance, we will talk about three things, what it describes, what it defines, and what it impacts. So you see that there are like usual suspects, availability, usability, integrity, and security of data. So something that relates to the business or like practical qualities of <clears throat> information that we process. Data governance defines processes, roles, policies, and standards, all kinds of the components of the framework that make it live. And it impacts information or the data that we process, it impacts technology, it impacts people, and more importantly, it impacts culture. And apart from all like methodology uh, the definitions apart from everything that creates kind of a uh, governance framework, we probably should think that all things related to technology, all things related to information, they always hit the barrier of people's adoption. They often hit the cultural barrier and whatever we try to implement or try to resolve with the related changes is always about people and culture. Let's go further and talk about two definitions. First is data sovereignty. And this is a concept that tells that data is subject to the laws of the country where it was generated or collected. And the second is a related concept. It's a data residency or data localization. And it talks about the way how governments try to restrict the use of data outside of their jurisdictions. Um, if we go a bit more in depth, uh, one of the most often questions that we receive is, is it a restriction to process the data within the country only, or can data be transferred? And the answer is, it depends, because sometimes there is a restriction of certain processing outside of the country. Sometimes there is a restriction of having data only within the country, and sometimes it can be both. And uh, in certain cases, it, it depends on the law and the type of data. We'll dive into a bit more details later. The main topic of today's conversation is data sovereignty, and it came from the concerns that um, governments are not able to control the data. And if you look at the whole evolution of the data use, uh, governments understand that the data becomes more and more valuable asset and something that has a strategic meaning, something that has a national meaning. And it applies both to financial data, to personal data of citizens, their habits, interests, and of course to the health information that governments have on, on file about the citizens. So and that was a natural choice. We have on one side, we have the development of the cloud services, on the other side, we have a uh, development of data value, and there are two different directions. One to make data more accessible. Generally, this is where the internet develops, how internet develops. On the other side, um, it is about having control of the data that you assess. And we see that once governments claim data sovereignty for the most critical assets, data assets that they have. Uh, it causes some conflict with the need and demand of data sharing on global use and reuse of data. And this is one of the inherent conflicts that we have in data sovereignty. This is a very recent picture uh, demonstrating how many countries have recently adopted data privacy laws. And if we look on the like, statistics behind them, in this or that form, more than 50% of them have uh, statements or clauses about data sovereignty. So quite a lot of countries consider or also <coughs> overview or think about introducing requirements for data sovereignty in their, in their laws. At the same point of time, you can see that if you compare this picture to what was five years ago, the amount of the countries with the acting data privacy legislation, including legislation for 
the cross border data transfer and requirement is more sensitive data in the country, it, it grows. And uh, we, we expect that within five years that the coverage and the impact of data, uh, data protection regulation will be much stronger than even now. There is a conflict of data story. On one side, we talk about freedom of information and the opportunities that shared use and reuse of data gives to researchers, to, to the communities, to, to mankind in general. At the same point of time, there are also technical aspects of that, cloud services and cloud storage of data are very easy to use, are very inexpensive. And uh, they give a lot of opportunities for cloud processing and capabilities that we have never had before. At the same point of time, it comes from the cost of limited control of the data and uh, kind of a lack of trust to anyone who maintains the cloud, anyone who has uh, control over the infrastructure that processes our data. On the contrary, if the country introduces if the country introduces a data resilience regime. Uh, they think that they have full control and ownership of the data. They have less dependency from all kinds of external factors. And they, at the same point of time, they may have reduced capabilities for research and reuse of this data. There is no silver bullet and there is no solution. We see how the situation is evolving. And the tendency is that we will see more data resonance which is uh, in, in action rather than uh, more freedom in use, using and reusing the data. The impact is not like, predictable, but at the uh, same point of time, I think that the industry and the technology is fully adapted to that and we'll see what kind of technical solutions and what kind of approaches exist to handle the more like, tightened data, share, sharing a data transformation. Let's think about how data sovereignty matters to us. Why do we generally talk about this in relation to health information systems? So first of all, we have to meet regulatory requirements. So whatever we create, whatever we use as an information system, it should be legal and it should be protected by, uh, let's say, covered by the legal requirements within the, the country. The second is once planning or refactoring the system, we need to understand the impact on the server architecture. So this is where the like, technical part starts and we need to decide, can we use cloud services? Should we have everything on promise? Can we use local cloud? Where we store backup? And different question, what's the latency? Can we afford having the server stored, uh, the latest stored on the server in another country? What's the cost of that and so on and so on. The next important topic is data ownership. It is generally required or generally mandated by most of the information security and data governance standards. And data ownership is one of the like, core concepts that govern the use of data. So once there is an owner of the data, he can define what to do with this data, what risks apply, and what decisions the organization should or the country should make in relation to this data. Then the next, I would say, is, is a step we need to plan budget and data capacity. So the planning for data governance impacts where we store the data and the whole framework of the requirements. So it is somehow formed by uh, restrictions that exist from the uh, legal, legal point of view and from the data governance process. To the own technology stack, depending on the solutions that we have, and understand what kind of capacity we need. And we need to ensure smooth operations to keep the criteria, to keep the, uh, the data quality at the desired or required level. And finally, we need to protect the data. So these components are maybe not the full list, but quite a big impact list of things that we need to consider while implementing our systems or while thinking about data governance. Now let's look a bit into 
different types of data processing, and we will start with local data processing structure. So one of the clear aspects, one of the clear things that comes to mind first, we'll talk about benefits, it's supporting the uh, development of in-country infrastructure capability. So once we say that we would like to store data in the country, we un unlock the opportunities for building the data centers and uh, we unlock the opportunity for uh, creating infrastructure and enabling uh, the local businesses to use the data and transfer information within, within the country. There is an uh, index of internet connectivity, which defines uh, the speed of connection to the internet in different countries. The same uh, index can be generally applied or can be measured against the data capacity that exists in the country, the amount of data centers, and the latency to these data centers. So I definitely recommend, I'll send a link later, but I definitely recommend to uh, use this kind of resource to check uh, and compare the levels of. Uh, development of the data processing facilities in any, any country and see what is a kind of the best approach. Then government, uh, the data owner has some leverage over the providers and uh, this is also the way of control and have a, a kind of a better security and better control framework related to the critical data protection. And also which uh, I think if you look at the World Trade Organization's uh, annual risk reports, uh, this is one of the emerging topics, uh, protection against all kinds of the uh, sanctions, uh, all kinds of the geopolitical risks, uh, having data within your country reduces it significantly. Also, it has a technical reason that you don't need to um, think a lot about outbound internet connections, which are not available for the high quality in the market. At the same point of time, local data processing has quite significant challenges and issues to consider. Uh, first of all, when you start developing uh, data centers, businesses or services, foreign services in the new market, there is not that much competition and in order to reach a certain level of stability to reach a certain level of uh, quality you need to like pass quite a long way and uh, like robust solutions are not available from day one so it means that especially if, if there is a, not that much developed infrastructure in the country you will always uh, have a lower SLA you will always have some kind of uh, service quality issues of course it comes with a high operational cost and uh, if you see the recent uh, developments, for example, in the server equipment price uh, and uh, the time that is needed to book and deliver servers, it takes months uh, or even half a year, even up to the year for specific integrations. It means that uh, it is not something that is immediately available in the market, even if you have uh, funds uh, to, to buy it. There are other technical difficulties like uh, over projecting of virtual machines, uh, capacity planning issues, and also it's a problem of skills and uh, access to the market of skills in, in place in the country. So you need to rely either on the local university yeah, that have uh, ready to hire graduates or quite experienced uh, engineers in the same market. Quite a city walk for this picture. <laughs> this also happens, and uh, once we talk about statistics, uh, it, it, server uptime is typically very fragile, and I think that every engineer or every manager of the information system have uh, all uh, have experienced something like that at least once. And uh, the more we are in the industry, the more we look at that. I think the probability of uh, getting into such situation is increasing. What else can we do? We can use cloud data processing, which is, as we mentioned, it is cost effective, it is easy to scale quickly, so you can buy more disk space with a single click of mouse. 
uh, you probably have less cons concerns about managing equipment because everything is provided as a service and you literally don't know where it all runs. And you can get quite a lot of complicated uh, configurations out of the box without any extra effort. And then at the same point of time, there are drawbacks as always. Uh, payment, payments are complicated. Sometimes payments are subject to delays. Sometimes are payments uh, subject to inter-country sanctions or uh, trade wars or any kind of extra uh, co complications. Uh, sometimes of payments typically supported by providers are not uh, recognized by the most of the budgeting authorities in many countries. Sometimes you can't impact the scheduled downtime and then you have a mission critical task. The server provider can have a downtime that, you, that will be gradually reduced. And uh, the biggest issue, I think, the, is the issue of trust, because even if it is a kind of a public cloud with a lot of certifications, uh, annual audits, assessments, it is quite hard to validate uh, the trust in, in this infrastructure and generally validate the trust uh, in the third party. So that's why, um, if we look at like, more straightforward alternatives uh, for the case of storing the data, uh, there is no solution. There is always a competition between storing the data within the country or having it in the cloud. And disregarding the way or the path that is select, uh, as we discussed at the very beginning, there are other factors that impact uh, the data that's stored. And one of them is security. And security is not only about having trust, but it's about following a set of measures and procedures in relation to the data. And if security itself now became a kind of a self-contained and uh, independent discipline, so it means that whenever you have sensitive data stored locally or in the, in the cloud, uh, different legislations or different, let's say, regimes or law regimes, legal regimes, they require uh, specific uh, processes and specific procedures for handling the data. Um, and the more sensitive data is, the more obligations we have in relation to this data. And typically, it's not about just putting data in the local server or in the cloud. It's also about ensuring uh, quite a complicated or quite a robust process of handling this data, including access control, backups, uh, capacity planning, change management, and incident management. And uh, as a kind of a quick Illustration of that, we would like to talk about incident handling and we'll talk about some requirements that uh, are related to incident handling. And I will ask Nathalie from CDC to talk about this. Yes, thanks. Test. Hey everyone. Um, so, as Michael said, my name is Nathan Volker. I work for the CDC. Um, and what I'm going to discuss is actually um, related to my function as a co chair on a small working group from the State Department's PEPFAR, PEPFAR initiative. Who here um, does any kind of work with PEPFAR? Is that a curiosity? All right, there's a few of you. So uh, just before I go into what I'm going to describe, this is very early. I'm going to that having slides. Uh, this came up in a conversation with Bob, um, Michael, and, and David, um, and they asked me to do a quick blur because it's an example of data, data governance. So to get to the point, um, there is a requirement in the country operational plan 2022. That's on the State Department's website. Um, for those of you that are aware of this, um, you know, plans and, and in governance around PEPFAR work, and there is more IT language in that country operational plan than really any previous year from understanding. But in there, um, I can't remember the exact page number, but there is an incident reporting requirement. Um, if a PEPFAR funded partner, so some kind of PEPFAR funded activity, 
has a breach of personally identifiable information. So any kind of you know data if put together or individually can identify someone. If there's a breach of that data, and that, that's a broad term, that could mean a lost laptop, that could mean a third party accessing your national data repository or our EMR. Um, you need to contact and notify your PEPFAR agency. So it means USAID, State Department, but, um, CDC, et cetera. So we're still developing standard operating procedures at the agencies. Um, we're developing training. Um, so I'm, I'm, I don't have a timeline yet, but you should see some kind of notification on this requirement um, pretty soon, hopefully, hopefully in the next six months. We'll see. Um, I'll leave it there. If you have any, um, for the sake of time, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to grab me up. I can let you know what I know. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Okay. Uh, so the requirement of reporting about the incident is generally mandatory in any kind of a privacy law. And I think that if you look at the whole life cycle of the data that you process, the life cycle can take two years, five years, 10 years, or even 50 years. And we, with the incident reporting, we have a really very short timeline. It is literally hours, maybe days, depending on which law applies. And uh, typically, we are not very prepared to act that quickly. And staying aware or staying on the top of this process is quite an unusual practice. And it requires quite a lot of training. And it requires uh, a lot of internal work for the team to ensure that they process the data. Uh, efficiently when they have enough safeguards and the safe control controls in place. So um, the more requirements like that we have, it brings us uh, to the like much more difficult and much more challenging environment, which uh, is quite reasonable from the data protection side, but this is something that we are generally not very prepared to. Um, Let's talk a bit about practical aspects of data governance. And the first one is about data ownership. So it is a key concept because data owner is a party that makes key decisions about the data. First, it's about data strategy, how we use the data, what we use the data for, what are the most important elements of the life cycle, what's about retention of the data, and so on and so on. Um, the data owner typically establishes high-level operation data processing requirements. So who is allowed to process the data, and uh, what kind of processing is generally allowed. He, he or she also approves functional changes and access to the data. And of course, uh, this role defines backup requirements and data retention policy. Sometimes uh, we here, okay, we have a retention policy, we have data backup, we have access control process. But when we start asking who's the data owner who decides, it turns out that there is no person from the like, uh, appropriate level of seniority or uh, appropriate level of vision to make these decisions. And uh, in case of the incident or in case of the force measure, we uh, need to rethink and we need to find the proper stakeholder who can approve access to data or can handle the incident or can help to revise the current strategy and uh, show the direction. Uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, technical decisions and uh, a lot of issues with these decisions, they come from the lack of ownership, uh, which is quite natural due to the historical development of information systems. So one of the immediate advice that we have is to talk to your data owner, understand that this is a real data owner, and confirm that your current view on data governance is aligned with their views. Data lifecycle. Um, we talked about data lifecycle, and uh, this is what 
we um, can, or is this how we can tie, tie different stages of using the data with different types of security measures to be protected? Uh, there will be a lot of many comments on this picture, but uh, I would like to keep it as a kind of connection between what we do with the data and how we protect. And uh, I think it's one of the most, like, most frequent illustrations of the, how data life cycle should, should look like. Uh, depending on the methodology used for description of the data life cycle, there can be different stages, there can be less, more, more stages, but at least this one is quite comprehensive and shows a lot of elements that you probably should implement or remember about. Capacity planning. Uh, this is quite a complicated topic and it includes uh, a lot of math uh, to study and to apply, but at least uh, you can just go through your current capacity planning process and see what is the, your production data size, what is your data backup size, how much data do you store in cache, and uh, how much data is uh, storage, uh, storage volume is also for the loss. And then you can make an estimate for the next one to year and see if your current uh, storage capacity matches this, this plan. There are different ways to find that, but at least this is the kind of in-depth way of dealing with the capacity plan. We discussed the difference between local data center or local cloud and uh, looked into cloud solutions in the market. Um, there are some hints to that help, may probably help to define if your current solution of uh, you know, on premise can work. You can probably study typical SLAs for popular cloud services and offer what you have and try to operate a local SLA. And uh, then it can help you to understand if the local SLA is sufficient or what can be done to improve it. And of course, you need to uh, sign up for a data owner to, uh, to see if they are happy with your current evaluation of the data and else. Most of the methodics they are publicly available, there are different approaches to calculate that. And during the expert launch, we can make a dive into this topic if you are interested. I'll mention also some commercial solutions in the market. So for those who would like to use cloud solutions but still are thinking about data authorization and have requirements to store the data on the premise, uh, key cloud providers like AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud, they have solutions for that. They're a bit different in terms of what they offer, but at least uh, key technology providers, they have solutions for government clouds, for private clouds, and for putting the data locally. Also, they uh, heavily subsidize uh, moving to the cloud, and in all the markets, there are different uh, options available, available, and uh, you can probably reach out uh, to, to your legal teams or your engineering architects to, to see if it makes sense to consider this. And another topic which is uh, even more shady than that is the uh, data sovereignty as a service, which uh, also is offered by the commercial partners. And they uh, say that they guarantee data sovereignty as a service uh, by encrypting the data. But there are little dispute discussions uh, about validity or uh, like, uh, legality of this uh, approach, but uh, still a lot of data processing happens in the cloud. And uh, uh, even if data is encrypted and shared between different regions, there are concerns that uh, about in-state data transfers and uh, potential of access into the cloud. Let's sum up what we discussed today. So, first, uh, privacy laws and data residence laws are changing quite often. And in the last years, we see an uh, emerging set of emerging uh, change in the regulation. So, there are new requirements appearing literally every quarter, and it's important to track what applies and what will be applied in the next two to five years. This is especially 
important that you consider developing new systems or you consider major upgrade or major rebuild of the architecture. It is also, I think, smart to look into what are the current government plans and plan your system architecture accordingly, looking at what will happen in the next two, five years. Data residency will definitely impact your operations. So it's about architecture, it's about access control, data management, and technical aspects of the comfort of using the data if it's stored remotely or locally. And we talked about clouds, cloud versus local solutions. Uh, cloud is great at the same point of time. At the very, very beginning of this talk, we talked about Web3. The web is developing in the direction where both people and governments and corporations would like to own the data. It means that uh, data ownership will become the key topic for the next years. And the ways to ensure that we have control over the data will be one of the prevailing topics in the system development and the operation architecture. So this is what the industry is going to, to develop and investigate. And generally think strategically, we see more and more data processed, we see more and more applications of the data, and uh, it means that in, in the next years, we will see a huge spike of new data users we will see more and more data being a kind of a concern. The value of the data increases, which means that the user data will be more and more related. That's all that we wanted to tell during these sessions. If you have quick questions, we, we will try to answer them right now. And uh, as a reminder, we will have another session at 4.30 p.m. where we can go in depth. Thank you.